So con continuing, really a great day so far of, uh, of entrepreneurs and innovators. Uh, Hardy, I've had a chance to visit with him. I've also been following him. And, ba and Vader has been uh, um, tracking and participating in the progress. It was our first interview. Of the first interview uh, of the company. And it's, an, it's, it's several things that I think are, we're going to dive in on this, but several things I think are really interesting, both about the company, but also about Hardeep's approach to building the business have been not only the innovation, but the, the, um, the innovation inside of a regulated industry. And so if we look at Airbnb and Uber and Collective Health and some, some great companies we've actually had on the Vader stage in the past, uh, the way they innovate inside of the constraints of the industries in which they operate uh, is, uh, is a, a, a fascinating topic, and I think also a lot of lessons learned for folks in the room, because I know several entrepreneurs here I spoke to today are also working in regulated industries. So I'm really looking forward to digging in on that. But before we dive in, Hardy, maybe if you could just briefly summarize, I think in your words would be best, um, you know, what you guys do, and, uh, and the, the sort of gap you saw in the market, and the problem you set out to solve. So uh, Motif, um is a next-gen investing platform. And, and the problem we solve uh, is that people can express to different degrees of complexity what it is they want to invest in. The hard part is acting on those expressions. So these expressions can be thematic. I live in a town called Hillsborough up north. I have drones flying over my house every day. I want to invest in drones. I don't know how. Uh, that's a thematic expression. Uh, I could be a trader, but I don't have time to follow the markets. I like buying beaten down stocks. Someone go do that for me. Or it can be completely passive. I want to invest like my old professor who's having another killer year running Yale's endowment. What we do at Motif is we allow people to act on these expressions by turning them into what we call a motif. A motif very simply is a basket of stocks thematically weighted to enable one of these expressions. And you can purchase a motif in a single click for the cost of a single stock transaction, you get to buy 30 stocks. Um, our, our customers like to think of Motifs as customizable, no-fee ETFs. But unlike ETFs, they're, they're no, uh, uh, there's no fund. So you actually own the underlying <laughs> securities, so you can change them into income. And it took our PhDs a year to build about 100 a, a of these Motifs. Uh, and then we turned our platform over to our customers. And then the time it took them to build 100 of Motifs, uh, our customers built 85,000 motifs. That's They're now incredible. over 320,000 motifs. There are only 7,000 mutual funds out there, 1,300 uh, ETS. So motif is really about investing uh, in a very natural way, in a very expressive way. Uh, and there is a motif for almost anything. And as you, if you, as you look at the evolution of motifs from the ones that you originally created with your team to now really UGC mm -hmm. investment strategies, uh, have you seen the style, the kinds of, the, the, the number of companies, the kinds of companies, the, 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 the form of those motifs change, or is it pretty consistent with what you created originally and you, you know, said the I tempo think it's, it, it is very different. I mean, I think the, the uh, power of having a community is they see things that you're not going to see, right? So think of motif as kind of a Peter Lynch meets a Jack Bogle. Yeah. The more Peter Lynches you have out there, the greater the community. Um, and so what we've done is we've, we've got a retail brokerage business and we, we got very good at building these motifs, these indices, if you will. So now we, we, we have our retail business, but we're also building these uh, really complex strategies for Goldman Sachs, for uh, 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 US Bank, and they're selling it to their accounts. So we have our own retail platform, but we've, we've gotten very good at building these models that we now actually sell them to Wall Street, and they sell it to their clients. Right, and we're going to dig, dig in both on your relationship with Wall Street, how they've become partners, capital formation, in, in a second. I want to go into that, but first, I want to go back to the beginning of the company, and um, we, we spoke previously about 
companies that start, you know, the, 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 lean, the lean model, the, I put something out there, I play with it, um, I, I, I get my customer feedback, I evolve, I iterate. And then there are companies that are trying to solve big, complicated, difficult problems that, that particularly if you're in a highly regulated industry like, fin like FinTech, where you can't, um, you can't just put something out there and see what happens unless you want to go to jail. I wish. Uh, the, um, could you talk about the research? How long from when you had the idea to when you actually launched your first commercial product and what went into, what went into that sort of journey? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, on the whole art of fundraising, uh, I wish we could have done the seed round thing and raised the loan. My, my legal bills from just getting started was going to be in the millions of dollars. Um, so that pretty much uh, ruled out seed. I need all your money to go into to legal costs. Um, so we, we raised a series A and B uh, right, off, right off PowerPoint. In fact, my, my, uh, only in this country can you actually raise that much money off PowerPoint. The, the, that's what makes... And how much was that Series A and B? Uh, 26 million. Wow. And, and so... Off a PowerPoint. Um, um, that's one hell of a PowerPoint. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm an ex-BCG <laughs> consultant. That's the one thing that you do yeah. learn uh, working a, a, at a consulting firm. Uh, but it was very powerful uh, for us to get the backing of some... Uh, really smart investors, and then one thing leads to another. And for us, we, we, we made a decision early on that we wouldn't go down the easy path, we would go down the hard path, because if we pulled it off, and in our case, we wanted to build a algo trading model uh, underneath it all, customers don't see it, that actually, uh, we wanted to uh, have a model that was low cost, low cost is low cost is Amazon, but we wanted to change the cost structure so it was very, very profitable. Right. And we felt if you could build a platform that had both, and most people don't build trading algorithms for retail investors. Uh, right. And so we saw an opportunity there to bring down the costs and, and pass that over. And so for us, the, the notion of raising, we needed a lot of capital, and then we needed a lot of help. So our, our first two rounds were, were through, through Silicon Valley VCs. Um, and the next two rounds were through Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. Uh, because we needed, we saw very early that the fintech world, the hardest part of fintech is distribution. Yeah. Customer acquisition costs, you know, I was talking to some of the entrepreneurs outside. In our industry, $1,000 to acquire a customer is about the prevailing uh, rate right now. And so you need a lot of capital if you're planning to build on that, or you have to find another world, way to get distribution. And, and so I, I want to I follow up on that. Um, no topic deeper and closer to my heart than distribution. The, um, the time, though, from when you, you, you raised the money, you sort of envision the idea to actually launching the first product. So um, it took us uh, from the first fundraise from the idea, it took us three weeks from the time we actually started building to when we launched a product, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. And your investors were cool with that? Yep. Wow. Yeah. And that were the Silicon Valley investors that you got, because it's such a... Uh, remarkable achievement to have raised that much money on a plan. Were they folks with deep understanding of financial services? Did they understand the problem, or were they folks who, who you sort of knew personally from your yeah. own background? No, no I didn't know any of them, but they, uh, we, we, you know, when you go to a VC and say, you know, we're regulated by the SEC, they kind of start to sweat already. That's right. Right? So, uh, Norwest and Foundation and Ignition uh, were our first investors. They had taken Lending Club Public, right. InvestNet, so we spent a lot of time doing our, this is before FinTech was hot and yeah. cool, right? It was the old days when no one cared about FinTech. So we went out to find investors. And honestly, what we wanted to do, we had to, they had to have companies in their portfolios that had been shut down by the SEC. That was literally the, the, the screening requirement. And if they hadn't been shut down, because the last, we didn't know if we were going to make it through or get shut down. And so the last thing you want as an investor is them panicking. Right. You wanted to them to have seen it before. Yeah. So that was, that was literally what we were looking for. And it narrowed it down to five or six yeah. VCs. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we were thrilled that Norwest Foundation led our Series A. Uh, and then Ignition came in on our B. So then if we take the arc of the journey, how much of your first thesis and PowerPoint and, and thinking was, hey, look, we're going to disintermediate Goldman. We're going to disintermediate folks on Wall Street. We're going to we're going to be the new thing, and, and these are the old. This is the old way. This is the big bad machine, and we're going to now come in here and change this game up. And then talk about where that started, and then now those being some of your biggest investors yeah. and being your distribution. Uh, I, I remember uh, giving a talk to to a large number, several thousand J.P. Morgan uh, employees, 
the day after uh, we announced our round, and we also uh, won a CNBC uh, Disruptor Award. Yeah. And in our profile, they said, you know, biggest investors, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, companies that are supposed to disrupt yeah. JP Morgan, yeah. Goldman Sachs. So they, they asked <laughs> me to kind of reconcile that. And, yeah. uh, and, and I think we, you know, I think this industry is pretty complex. And I think there are parts of the value chain uh, that need to be fixed. Yeah. Uh, there are other parts, you know, one of the hardest questions I always get asked is, you know, if you fintech guys from Silicon Valley unleashed on Wall Street, what's left of us? Right. right, and there is a lot, right? You know, I think we like to think there's you know, human relationships matter, uh, getting tailored financial advice matters, human insight matters. So we took the areas that we thought were pretty immune to disruption, and we said we're going to partner with strong players in each of those domains, right. and everything else we're willing to turn into the enemy, right. uh, but not those three areas. And so we went in with a compelling story of how we can work together to right. change the model of investing. Right. And, and it's, it's terrific now to have you know, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs as investors, but also as big clients of us. Right, and okay, so now let's, take a, let's take another, which, which is a remarkable journey right there in and of itself. Um, the, the regulated aspect of the business, you're, um, I read your bio, you're, you're have various advisory and board and relationships with, with FINRA, with the SEC, you're, you've done, A, a remarkable job of participating in the industry and trying to f work within the constraints, but you've also done a pretty remarkable job of working with, to, to, to advise on and influence and, 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 and a, you know, modernize the financial uh, infrastructure of, of the U.S. So that's an incredible achievement to have basically kind of worked both ends of the problem, if you will. Um, any thoughts on for companies here, how they par both participate in shaping the regulatory environment as well as you know, building a business inside of a highly regulated environment. Yeah, I remember when we got our membership, uh, we were applying for membership in FINRA. I get this nice little letter in the mail. Congratulations, Mr. Walia. Uh, we're putting you uh, on your application. We we've decided to put you on the new and novel list. And I went to my compliance officer and said, high five, we're new and novel. Even Finra thinks that. Yeah. And she burst into tears saying, that is the worst news you could possibly get. That's the go straight to jail list? Oh, and, 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 and it was funny because um, I, I didn't know much. I didn't even know what a compliance officer was when we started. Uh, but pretty soon, we realized in this business, uh, the, the rate limiting step of innovation is regulatory framework. Right. And so we went out to find people to help us. Uh, our first independent board member, it took us a while to get him to come on board, was Arthur Levitt, yep. former SEC chairman. And then we, we, I made it a point to go to any town hall where regulators were speaking, and I just asked them lots and lots of questions. Um, and after a while, they said, you know what? We can't answer your questions. Why don't you come help us answer them? Yeah. And it was those forums of going out there, finding out where regulators were speaking, uh, and then eventually we started working very closely and we tried to use Motif. Uh, there, there was an initiative called Cards. I wrote a blog on it. Think of it as minority report for regulators. Uh, they were going to suck up all this data and figure out where crime was happening, wherever it was. And, it, it, you know, I've been a big proponent of stop writing rules, start writing algos. Yeah. You want to root out fraud, you want to make this an, an easier place. So there was this initiative called Cards. And we actually... Uh, <laughs> put Motif as the first company who would subject itself to cards. Wow. Um, and you know, we went on, I, 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 I'm, I'm a frequent guest on CNBC, we invited the regulators on board and we talked about how cards was going to make things better for the average uh, uh, American investor. And I've always learned two things working with regulators. Always answer the question of what will happen if Grandma Jane accidentally finds this product? That's right. the question you always have to answer. And second question is this, can you look me in the eye and tell me what you're doing is good for the American investor. Right. And if you can hold those paradigms and ask lots and lots of questions, um, because a lot of cases they don't have the answers, and they're actually looking for help. Uh, and, and there's two ways of, of, of dealing with regulators, especially in Silicon Valley. You can put your head in the ground and hope they never show up and do whatever you want. Yep, it doesn't work um, too well typically. Uh, and in our case, I, I tease my board. I said our regulators have our five-year roadmap right. because it took us you know, two, three years to get certain parts of our business model approved. Yeah. And it takes a lot of time. And I spend now 20 to 25% of my time uh, dealing directly or indirectly with regulatory and compliance issues. 
Um, and at times it's as high as 50 to 60 percent. Great. So it is, it is a really important part of, of, of innovating. Masterful job. Um, now let's go back to distribution. So you, you, you got your first products out, you created a great platform, you had people enjoying the platform, you looked forward and said, we need to grow, cost of customer acquisitions very high in this business, distributions are going to be a challenge. Uh, at that time, I'm guessing you were pursuing Arthur Levitt as well to be involved, maybe not with the vision of how that could help. But as you began to look at the, the going from a first launch product mm -hmm. to a global presence, if you will, um, when did you sort of say, hey, look, I think, I think we need to go to Wall Street now. We need to sort of make nice, if you will. Yeah. We need to partner with them. We need to bring them a new product. Um, talk about that because that's a... That's a, it sounds, I'm guessing, was a bit of a change of strategy. It was a bit of some, some new thinking about how you would fit in with them and how receptive were they, how receptive were they to this new product? Because I'm sure to them it was something new and different and that's not exactly the easiest group to get to see yeah, the light. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think we were lucky that we dealt with the leadership and, and the, you know, I think people kind of uh, uh, think of Wall Street as dinosaurs. I mean, this isn't, uh, this isn't like Uber disrupting the taxi industry. I mean, right. these are really smart, very powerful people. And they totally get where the world is going, except they're running super tankers. Right. So the advantage you have is you're small and nimble, but it's not that they don't see where the markets are going, and, and, and I wish that were true. But a lot of cases, they, they do know your advantage is innovation, the ability to hire talent that they couldn't possibly hire. So they're very, very comfortable with, with you know, with, with recognizing innovation. Frankly, they, get, they got our business pitch. I, I could even finish the words. They kind of got it. Right. So they were so in tune with what we were trying to do, how our algos disrupt uh, the cost equation. Uh, and they're very skilled at algos, except their algos are designed to make money, right. uh, not to destroy costs. So yeah. uh, that, was, that was a little bit different. But no, they were uh, very supportive. Um, and I think we... Uh, the biggest advantage we had is people like Arthur, who I, uh, you know, we, we owe him quite a bit uh, uh, of credit to our success, was getting in front of the right people at these banks who had a holistic view of where the world was going. Um, and in terms of early on, I mean, I think we knew pretty quickly that, you know, you do basic math, it takes millions of dollars to build a brand. Yeah. And so the deals we, we ended up signing, and not only... We, we signed a deal with JP Morgan where they were going to distribute their IPOs exclusively on Motif's platform. Um, that was, for us, a way to get the brand out there, to get customer acquisition. Um, and it was an area that wasn't competitive uh, with the bank. Yep. And so we, we found ways to augment their capabilities versus disrupt. You're, you're going to have a tough time trying to get things done differently at a large institution, no matter what industry you're in. But if you can find a way where it's clearly win-win, um, and big companies move fast when you've got the support of their leadership. I think the hard part is getting the leadership on board. So, so last question on that, and I want to go over to entrepreneurship. And, and I don't see the time, but when I have five minutes, oh, five minutes, there it is. It says five minutes. Uh, so we'll take four and a half minutes. The, um, so short answer to this question, partnerships and distribution channels are tough to set up, mm -hmm. tough for startups to set up. They're, they're amazing if you can get them to work right because obviously it requires less capital if you can yeah. leverage and create a symbiosis with a, with a larger strategic player. Um, when you sat down to, to structure those deals, was it pretty clear what the economics were going to be? Was it clear what you could bring, what they would bring, and how you'd divide the rents? Or was it, was it like six months of just figuring out what the basic math no, it was? No, it was six to nine months of just figuring it out yeah. along the way. I think we had a vision of what we wanted to do. Uh, we just announced a partnership with Goldman Sachs where we're building uh, motif uh, structured notes for their yeah. clients. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, even getting through the regulatory approval process takes tons of lawyers, tons of time, um, and it, 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 it really does. And then the economics and all, a lot of that depends on how well the product's received in the market, yep. what their clients think. So it does take a lot of time, but I think if you find the right champion who totally gets it, yeah. right? I, first thing I tell any, anyone at uh, any large institution, just remember... Uh, a, 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 a month in your life is a year in mine. That's right. Right? So if we're not going to go in, so everything we do, we, 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 we start small, but we get something out in three months. And if they think you're going to get out in three months, it'll get done in nine months. 
but really this notion of getting them to empathize with startup. You won't be around yeah. if you don't get revenue and growth, and they need to understand how important speed is. So we almost had, I am an ex-consultant, we had a two by two. You know, can we get it done? How big is the opportunity? And you really focus on the things that can get done quickly, because I've seen companies get caught in this rat hole for years of not being able to get things out the door. And, and you really need to get that small, bite-sized project uh, and then start building off of that. Yeah, there's a great book from years ago about Go Corporation. Uh, uh, Kaplan wrote it about how they tried to do a deal with IBM and just could never get it off the ground. Yeah. They were backed by Kleiner, John Doerr. It's a great book. It's called Startup, actually. Um, last question. I want to get a couple questions from the audience. The, um, going back to just entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. You, um, you didn't go out and pitch VCs right out of the gate. No, I, you, tried, you, I avoided that. You avoided it. You, you, you took a different tack to getting your narrative right. And the interesting about it is it ended up being a narrative that accumulated, you know, um, attracted a significant amount of capital. So I think there's a lesson learned for the group here in just how you got that narrative nailed down. Because it, yeah. it, the other thing we discussed is the strategy didn't change. How you described it changed. Yeah. We, I, I wrote the initial business plan 80 times, and, and I met a lot of entrepreneurs who said, before you talk to a VC, pitch to 100 entrepreneurs, and they will be brutally honest, they will rip you to shreds, and unless you go through that process, uh, and I remember pitching you know, people with dual degrees and PhDs in astrophysics who said, look, I'm really smart, and I really don't understand your plan. Good, good, you know, who, how is anyone else going to do that? So that iterate, and, and, and entrepreneurs are very empathetic because they've all been through that process. Uh, and also, they, they have nothing to lose. They're, they were, one person said, this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. It's stupid. Like, there's no, and, I, and you want to hear that. You want to be able to respond to that. Because I know from friends of mine who've done the VC, you never get that kind of harsh feedback from yeah. VCs because in case they're wrong, yeah, they want to get you in the next round. Yeah, we're going to socialize <laughs> it with our partners. We'll yeah. get back to you next week. Yeah, and, if, yeah. and but they want to keep the optionality of, course, of yeah. getting back to you in the next round in case they've made a mistake. And so it, it's, it's not their fault. They, they, they might be wrong. They might be right. Uh, so for, for that whole process um, took, you know, uh, took a lot of time because I had a, 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 a referral network. Every five, ten entrepreneurs, at the end of it, I'd say, can you get me to three more? Yeah. And, 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 and we, we pitched and pitched and pitched. And, and our, uh, our beginning deck looked like a BCG deck. Yeah. Uh, our ending deck looked like a kitty deck. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and we tried to, like, because our stuff is so complicated, we didn't want to tell them about algorithms. We didn't want to tell them about how we did what we did. We just wanted to tell them the impact uh, and the advantage we have versus other people who are doing teenage social network, is our investors, our audience, understood what we were building, because they're investors too, different yeah. times. So they could connect they to the product, it, yeah. and, and they got it. So that was good. All right, two questions from the audience. Anybody have any questions they want to ask, burning questions? Uh, we have uh, time's up. So if there isn't one, that's not the end of the world. But I just wanted to make sure I gave everybody a chance if there was something you wanted to ask Hardeep. Uh, okay, I think we're uh, we're at the end. I want to thank you for participating. Oh, thanks for having it's me. It's been uh, it's a uh, it's a tremendous accomplishment what you've achieved, mm -hmm. and uh, we're, we're honored to have you here. So thank you. Thanks, right. everybody. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah.